Welcome to Sky Team's People First with Morag Barrett. So I am so excited to welcome this week, Karen Catlin, who after spending 25 years building software products and serving as a vice president of engineering at Adobe, Karen witnessed a sharp decline in the number of women working in tech. Frustrated, but galvanized, she knew it was time to switch gears. And so today, Karen is a vocal advocate for inclusion, a leadership coach, a keynote speaker, and the author of Better Allies, Everyday Actions to Create Inclusive, Engaging Workplaces. So Karen, welcome to People First. I am so looking forward to today's conversation. Thank you for having me on the show. I'm thrilled to be here. Okay, well, before we dive into your inclusive thought leadership and your book, etc., I'm going to take you all the way back to the beginning. Because with People First, I'm talking about journeys, leadership journeys, and they are convoluted. And you are a prime example of this. This is what your second or third career. But let's go back to the beginning. You're sitting in elementary school. The teachers just asked you to draw a picture of what you want to be when you grow up. So what was that picture that you had in your mind at that young age? Yes. Oh, and I, so at that young age, I was someone who loved making things. I was always crafting. I learned to sew very young. I knit. uh, I loved knitting. I was always making things. And as I thought about you know, what should I be when I grow up? It was definitely something I had to make. I had to make things. And it was, it probably wasn't until a little bit past elementary school, more like high school, when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to study and major in at college. I remember having a conversation with my dad and he pointed out this obvious thing, Karen, you love making things. You're always crafting and making. You're also good. And you're, you love solving problems, solving puzzles, doing puzzles and like crossword puzzles and that type of thing. And you're really good at math. So maybe you'd like to combine all of those things and study this brand new field called computer science. This was a long time ago. You have to realize Um, I graduated from high school in 1981. So this was well before the personal computer revolution, before we all had computers in our homes. It was new. And he thought, you know, you might you might really enjoy making software to combine all of these things that you're good at and you enjoy doing. So anyway, that's that's uh, my origin story. So thanks, Karen's dad, because that was your first pivot point. So tell me about some of the, the, as you reflect on your technology career then, what were some of the high points as you look back on those years? Yeah, so first of all, I love making software. So when I think about some of the high points, it was times when it was creating some new innovative solution to something. Right out of college, I had an amazing opportunity to work at the university I attended to stay right there and work in a research institute that at the time was doing incredibly innovative software research in this field called hypertext, which has over time become what we know as the World Wide Web and all of our Mm -hmm. web browsing and the knowledge of information. I mean, we can't imagine the world or doing business without the web now. But back in the mid 80s, it was very novel. And I was in a, a great research institute looking at Uh, best practices and user interfaces and usage patterns for this thing called a hypertext system um, and how to really leverage it. So that was an incredible high point. Um, It was fun in the moment, but it wasn't until, you know, sort of like now that I can really reflect and say, gosh, I was lucky to be there. And boy, was that an innovative place to be. Um, Mm -hmm. I've also had the opportunity to work internationally, which has been an incredible experience. I spent a year working in the UK, working actually for a Japanese firm in the UK. And um, let me just tell you, it was, uh, I felt like a fish out of water at times, um, both, you know, culturally, everything was different, just being in a different country and then having the added like level of uh, different cultural norms for a Japanese Mm -hmm. company. So I learned a lot uh, by doing that. Um, and then I moved to Silicon Valley, uh, which in, um, which was an amazing experience. And that's where I am still based today. And I have had the opportunity to work at startups, small companies, 
as well as much larger companies. And I've also been through the whole process of being acquired by a very large software company, um, which was Adobe Systems. So I've, I've been able to see the small, innovative uh, startup culture, as well as the larger corporate machines, uh, so to speak, that are so uh, vibrant and necessary for you know, creating the technology we rely on today. Mm -hmm. So I love all of that broad spectrum of experience that you've just outlined there that you now bring to work in terms of the two books that you have, but the keynote speaking and the work that you do with consulting. So what was the push that made you decide to leave the, the perceived safety of a corporate environment and to branch out on your own and start, start writing and start speaking? Yes. And I, so first of all, I never had a goal to be an author. I never had a goal to run my own business. I was frankly happy and always had been in places where I got kind of a regular paycheck and there is a safety. Um, and it's, frankly, it was a very lucrative career I had. Yet when I, while I was still at Adobe, I was a vice president of engineering there and I was the most senior woman on the engineering side of the company. And Basically, I started realizing that there was a problem with gender diversity in the industry. Now, today, everyone talks about it. It is well known. But this is going back, oh gosh, 12 years roughly, mm -hmm. where the conversation was barely starting. You know, Sheryl Sandberg had not, read, had not written Lean In yet, uh, for example. So it was very early in sort of this um, awareness that there was a problem with gender diversity in tech. And I was like, I have a role to play here. Um, so at Adobe, I started our women's employee resource group. I started mentoring a lot of women and I started just advocating for women in various meetings I was in and making sure that we had a focus on supporting the women across the company. And after doing that for a number of years, in addition to all of my VP of engineering work, you know, kind of one became my passion and it wasn't VP of engineering anymore. I wanted to help women be successful in tech not just at Adobe, but kind of across the whole industry. So that was the pivot, is just realizing this is what I want to be doing and what I want to be spending my time on and being in a financial position that allowed me to take that risk with my mm -hmm. career. Um, so I started my leadership coaching business. That was the first step. I wanted to be a leadership coach for women working in any tech company in any role. Um, and I love doing that so much that... And I still do it today. I mean, it's, it's leadership coaching. I just absolutely love doing it. Yet early on, I realized I had a problem. And the problem was, even if I were like the most amazing leadership coach on the planet, still working towards that, but even if I were, my clients who are all amazing, they were still facing challenges because the closer you got to the C-suite in any of their companies, just the mailer and paler it got. And the demographics, I mean, it's like, with all due respect to anyone who's male or pale on pale, uh, who's listening, it, it's just, that's what the demographics were like in all of their companies. And I started paying attention to inclusion and like, why is this happening? Why is the pyramid kind of set up so that you have more diversity in the ranks of employees at the lower levels and less as yep. you get to the top? Um, and I really thought it was inclusion. That was the real problem, um, generally speaking. And I was like, it's not that hard to be inclusive at work. It's not that hard once you realize what's going on that's not inclusive to take action. So I started an anonymous Twitter handle because I wanted to change the world. And of course, the first thing you do when you want to have like a big initiative and want to change the world is you start a hashtag or start a Twitter handle, right? So I started the Twitter handle at Better Allies about six years ago now. And my goal was simply to raise awareness about how some people experience the workplace, which is very different than people in the majority, and share these everyday actions. You know, simple things like, you know, I pledge to notice when an interruption happens in a meeting and redirect the conversation with a simple, hey, let's hear Anna finish her thought, for example. That's a simple everyday action that makes a difference. Um, so I started just this anonymous Twitter handle. I started tweeting different things at times. I got a little snarky, I must admit, um, such as, you know, I would read in the press that Travis Kalanick, who was the CEO of Uber um, and founder of it, when he was still CEO of Uber, it came out in the press that he was using the nursing mother's room for his personal phone calls. 
Of course, that's not cool because nursing mothers can't get in to do what they need to do, right? Yeah. So when I read that, I would go over with a little snark. Um, you know, I would go over Twitter and say, you know, I pledge not to use the nursing mother's room for my personal phone calls, period. Unlike Travis Kalanick at Uber mm -hmm. and then link to the story. So anyway, I'm just tweeting once or twice or three times a day. Just when I see things, think of things, I'll, I'll share that. And then I started getting speaking engagements. I started getting speaking engagements to this anonymous Twitter handle. People saying, you know, anyone from that Better Allies Initiative do any public speaking? And <laughs> my first reaction, <laughs> I know, initiative, like, like who? It's just me a little bit every day. It's not a big deal. Um, so I was honored, um, but I wanted to stay anonymous. So I would write back and I would say, yes, one of our contributors does some public speaking. We'll put you in touch with her. And then I would send them a message from my personal Twitter account okay. and, and basically say, hey, I'm Karen Catlin. I contribute to Better Allies and I love public speaking. What do you have in mind? It's so almost started, like you're a superhero. You see, you take the glasses off and you're Better Allies. You put them on and you're Karen. <laughs> Woohoo! I'm glad we've got Karen today, but also with the input. So I'm curious, if you started to tweet, what were some of those microaggressions, just um, things that were happening in the workplace that people were oblivious to, but ultimately were making people of minority, people of color, people, women, whatever, but marginalizing individuals yes. and groups? Yes. And I'm so glad you phrased the question you did, because I should emphasize that while my initial focus, when I started doing this work, I was focused on gender diversity, but mm -hmm. I soon realized that I needed to understand the perspective of anyone from an underrepresented group and the challenges they were facing and how that you know showed up at work and what people could do about it. Mm -hmm. So, um, so some of those other examples, um, women, and there's, I'm not a researcher, but I mine research that's out there on the challenges underrepresented groups face at, at, at work and in society at large. And so one example is that women, and especially women of color, tend to be asked to do more office housework than their male mm -hmm. peers. Office yeah. housework are things like, what, tell me, what do you think of when I say office housework? What's, well, what's an example of that? I flash back to my career in finance, which was late 80s, early 90s, where like you, women at the senior levels were uncommon. And every time I went into a meeting, even though I was one of the senior managers, everybody would look and say, are you going to go and get the tea and coffee? Yep. Are you going to take the notes? And yep. at that time, I still did because one didn't speak up. You just worked hard and somebody will notice that you're doing a good job. So those would be two of my examples, the can you go and get the tea, can you take the minutes? Exactly. And I, um, these are things that they need to get done for the mm -hmm. health of like an office, an organization. But if they're not your job, they're not in your job description to do that, then it's office housework. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you are the, the tea person or an administrator or even a, um, a project manager who's supposed to take minutes at a meeting, for example, that's fine. That's your job. But when it's not your job and you're maybe the only woman in the room and you get asked to do these things, um, it becomes office housework and it puts you in a subservient role to your peers. Not good. Yeah. So that's an example of a microaggression that women and, and especially women of color, they have it. Um, they, they do even more of this office housework. Um, and frankly, often women and women of color do it because they, as you, as you've experienced, you know, you want to just like, of course I'll do it. I'll be a team player. If I do all the rest of my work well, people will notice that I am worthy of being here and worthy of being promoted and given more responsibility. Um, so we do it, but we, it does hold us back. Um, and there's so many more examples of that office housework. It is like collecting the money for a team baby shower for some, some teammate who's having a baby, or it's organizing an offsite for yeah. uh, the team or in our virtual world, it is, um, hey, can someone, you know, text the three people who are missing from this meeting because they're not here yet and we, we won't start before they get here. So it's often a woman having to go off and figure out how to DM or text the people who are missing. Um, so that's like one example. When that happens, women are like, they feel like they're less than and it does lead to career uh, or impact their career growth going forward. Um, want one more example of 
go for it. I love examples because it just brings it alive. Yes. So another is idea hijacking. This is what happens potentially. It doesn't just happen to women, but definitely (laughs) happens to women. When um, a woman might say something at a meeting and it doesn't really get picked up as a good idea, the conversation continues, but then someone else, usually a man, says the same exact thing in the same meeting and gets all the credit. That's called Mm -hmm. idea hijacking. And again, like the woman who said it originally is like, well, what, 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 what? like, didn't anyone hear me when I said it, right? What's going on? And why do I even bother here? Like, I'm not respected. Why am I even here? And like, that's the mindset. Um, Yeah. And I'll, I'll share one more which is based on research from the Stanford Clayman Institute, which studies women in, uh, in the workplace. And what, the, um, what their, one of their research studies showed is that uh, they studied annual performance reviews for thousands of people working in, like th- I think it was three large tech companies and a professional services company. And in these thousands of annual written performance reviews, they noticed gender differences in the feedback people were getting, where women um, tended to get feedback that more aligned with um, how nice they were and how um, how easy it was to work with them, whereas men tend to get feedback about, here's the impact you're having, here's the skills you need to learn to have more impact. Yeah. Um, and they also women got much shorter reviews than men, meaning they just had less mm-hmm. feedback to act on. So these are all examples. And what I love figuring out is not just like sharing, like here are the problems, but here are things anyone can do to, for, you know, to address this, to disrupt this pattern, to make some changes and be more inclusive. So my whole focus is what is the action that you can take now that you are aware perhaps that women get shorter performance reviews? Well, <laughs> check next time you're writing a performance review, make sure it is of equal length, right? Easy. Mm-hmm. And that's what I loved about your book, Better Allies, because as I went through it, it starts with 50 examples of privilege, which again is language that we are starting to hear more commonly within uh, 2020. But examples of if you've never experienced this, then you have privilege, at least in that area, and that makes a difference. And to your point, though, this is insidious. It's been baked into our environment over generations. The time for change, thank goodness, is now. Diversity, Linda Sharkey and I write about this in the Future Proof Workplace, diversity has never been the issue We are diverse as human beings by nature. You just have to walk out your front door, hopefully, and you'll see that. But the opportunity, the inclusivity, and then the sense of belonging when I get there, because I also remember you get to a certain level and you now maybe have a seat at the table, but do I want to stay when all around me is locker room um, conversations? And it was funny, as I was preparing for our conversation today, I was remembering in the very first branch I worked for in my finance career, um, one of the senior leaders, you got to remember, I'm just out of high school, had a, pic- a picture of a semi-naked pinup model <laughs> on his desk, at his desk. Because <sighs> it was in the national newspapers at the time, page three, for any of the English uh, viewers for this. But that was acceptable then. I remember we started scribbling on it and changing. But even then, it was a passive, passive aggressive. We were like, laughing it off because we didn't want to create a scene. We knew it was wrong, but the powers that be didn't do anything different. So I know in this week's newsletter, because I I, I get your newsletter and the the five uh, behaviors and the five uh, ally, ally actions that we can take. And number one this week was know when to call out bias, even in public. And so you talk about making it practical. So for all of us, I'm sure we all in the cold light of day like to think that we would call out a friend for an inappropriate joke or a comment. But in reality, I'm sure we can all think about situations where we didn't. So what are some of the excuses and mind trash that you hear that get in the way of us actually doing it? And then the second bit is, so what advice do you have so that we can have it ready to go the next time this happens? Yeah. And I get it because I'm living this as well. Um, this, is it, is it worth it? Is it worth actually calling this out at that family dinner or with a friend who just said something that was maybe even 
um, just a tiny bit offensive. Mm -hmm. Forget about like outright racist, um, really in your face racism or something like that. Um, so we, in our head, we're like, it's just not worth it. I don't want to disrupt the apple cart. Like I don't want to um, cause any harm to our friendship. You know, that's the mindset and I get it. I also believe that probably a lot of people listening, maybe you and definitely me, like I was raised in an, a, a work ethic of you criticize in private, praise in public. So you give that constructive criticism in a one-on-one -on -one kind of setting. So you don't embarrass them. You don't shame them. You just let them, you know, you give the feedback, but it's private. And then in public is the praise. You, you point out all the good things. And in some ways, when we see offensive behavior or biased behavior, um, we need to kind of unlearn that and take, you know, action in the moment. If in it, it's not hundred percent of the time, but if we think that, there is some harm that could happen. Harm being that this is um, someone here, you know, in the room or on the call is going to be offended and pull back from being able to do their work today. You know, something like that. That's harm. Um, or if we just need to like disrupt the path that is going down, like this is not looking good. If we all start like laughing at this, um, this person or this race or making homophobic jokes or something, this is not something I want to keep, you know, hearing. So I need to stop it in the moment. And so, um, being aware that sometimes we do need to speak up and call it out in the moment, um, I think is, is the first step. So you, uh, those two examples are kind of a rubric you could apply, but you got to make it your own, figure out your own mm -hmm. personal approach. Um, and then how do you do this? Um, you know, calling out in, in my newsletter, I have a few phrases. I don't have it right in front of me, so I'll, I'll do my best to remember um, some of them. But, you know, one is simply like, well, hold it right there. I need to understand what you just said. You know, it's just like, to like really like put the you know brakes yeah. on whatever's happening. Um, do you have the newsletter up? Could you read the I three do. I examples? Do. So, oh, good, good. Maybe you could read them out. I can. I'll read them out. So, wow, no, ouch! I need to stop you right there. So I'm even going to go into full dramatic art. I need to push back against that. I disagree. I don't see it that way. And then the third one was, okay, I'm having a strong reaction to that, and I need to let you know why. Yeah. And it's interesting because all of those take courage and vulnerability, as Brene Brown would say, to actually do in the moment. And the risk is we'll say in our head, well, I'll do it later. Or you know what? Karen's that person's boss. Karen will do it later in private. And the risk is that none of us do it later in private. And therefore, the, the feedback isn't given. And so having some phrases and just anticipating what will you do the next time somebody makes an off-color joke? Will you laugh awkwardly or will you step into your truth and gently or assertively say, hey, not cool? Exactly. You know, and I'll also share one of my favorite phrases that I use when I'm trying to give feedback to someone. I had to do it recently. I am in a book club and we were reading a book by a black author about anti-racism. And one of my friends said after, well, and I should say that this author also has videos that accompany the book. So we'd watched a video and my, one of my friends said, I really enjoyed the video. I found the author so articulate and well-spoken, blah, blah, blah. And I decided not to call her out in public, but afterwards, after our meeting, I texted her and I said, can we, do you have time for a quick call? Got on a call. And I said, I want to give you feedback if you're open to it. She said, sure. I said, so you said this black author is, was articulate and you like that about her. And I want to tell you something, and this is, I'll back up here. The, the approach I take is seek common ground and then educate. So here's mm -hmm. what I did. I said, I want to let you know, like I used to think telling someone or saying someone was articulate and well-spoken was a compliment. I used to think that, but I have since learned that black people do not take it as a compliment because of the underlying sort of assumption that they couldn't possibly be articulate, well-spoken, highly educated. Mm -hmm. um, so seek common ground. I used to think that too, but I have since learned and then educate. It's a, it's a soft but very direct way, and it feels very natural for me now to be able to apply that to different situations. 
Okay, so I'm going to push back a little bit because I'm sure in your keynote speaks speeches and stuff, somebody will come up to you afterwards and say, oh my goodness, Karen, that was brilliant. You are so articulate. And so doesn't not speaking actually run the risk of we're not giving the positive feedback that we truly mean because there was no underlying intent to do it based on race or gender or age or technical competence. It was just, you just delivered a really powerful message. So it's so tell me that, line. tell me, tell me, I just, you are a powerful keynote speaker. Most people aren't. That's a compliment. Telling a black person they're articulate is the assumption that most black people are not articulate. So I'm calling it out, but tell me I'm a powerful keynote speaker. I would love that. And that's a compliment. So do you see this, the subtle difference there in terms of um, what is the underlying assumption? Do most people have this or are you outstanding because of you are different than most people of your, um, you know, genre, your demographic? So it's interesting because it is subtle, but it is powerful. And it also is what can cause for me, my brain to spin as I second guess, out guess, overthink, underthink, oh, too late, the moment's passed, I'm not going to say anything. And you talk about that in this week's, coincidentally, this week's newsletter about language, when you talk about using the phrase exempt versus yeah. grandfathered in. And I'll admit, as I was growing up and we were in my early career and people were saying, oh, well, we're no longer a chair chairman, we're chairpersons or we're the chair. And I was going, oh, um, but I realized then that was still with the naivety of my youth. Yeah. So semantics matter. Yes. And yet we don't know until after we've said it, for example, the difference between English and American, common but very different languages it's easy to make a faux pas, but it, for it not to have ever intended to be offensive. So yeah. how do we handle that? Mm -hmm. So apologize and, and correct yourself. Here's something I say all the time, and I'm embarrassed, but I'll, <laughs> I embarrass myself a lot. <laughs> I, you know, I, it, some, like my son will say, mom, thanks for making me breakfast. Um, or something like that. And he's, he's in his twenties, he's living with us because of the pandemic. And so it's nice that I make him breakfast every now and then, not very often, I must admit, but every now and then. So he'll say, mom, thanks for making me breakfast. Now I might've toasted an English muffin and put some peanut butter on it. Like not, not a big breakfast, not a big deal. And so I'll say, oh yeah, I slaved over it. <laughs> oh, so that still comes out every now and then, even though I'm trying to not reference this terrible part of our history of actually having slaves. And so when I say it, oh, I slaved her. And then I say, it wasn't a big deal. You know, I'll correct myself. So apologize, correct yourself and pledge to do better. And if you're like me, who has these, this, these language patterns that I'm trying to retire, um, tell someone around you, like, can you call me out when I say the word slave like that? Uh, mm -hmm. I've slaved over it. Call me out. Or when I use the word guys to me, a gender neutral group, call me out. And um, this isn't it? And it's unlearning habits and relearning. And it's yeah. not just a female issue, whether it's um, the when we're looking at the gender di uh, disparity in senior levels. I know from personal experience as well, it goes the other way. So I have had a stay at home husband who raised my three boys. And again, you talk about parental leave and the, res the reports continue to show that parental leave when it's offered, men um, are reluctant to take it for fear of it being a career black mark. Mm -hmm. So how do we make sure that this is an and conversation and not just more narrowly focused on male, female issues um, but making sure we're looking holistically at how we incl we're inclusive for everybody. Wow, that's that's a big question, and <laughs> we only have a few minutes, so they. I know. Start it. <laughs> so I mean, I'm going to uh, make this. I'm going to oversimplify it, I guess, because um, just because we don't have time to get into all of it. But I mean, the first step is to understand that people our experience in the workplace probably different than ourselves, especially if we consider ourselves at all a part of the majority. Um, even as a woman in tech, I am part of the majority because I'm white, mm -hmm. I'm college educated, I have a lot of credibility behind me, I'm, I'm in the majority. But I have to realize that people who are people of color, men and women, are going to have a very different experience. 
people who are coming into tech from potentially like an armed services type of training are going to have a very different experience than the college educated computer scientists coming in. Right. Um, and so on and so forth. So we have to realize that just because we have not experienced something ourselves, when someone tells us about a microaggression or feeling not included, we have to pay attention. We have to take time to understand it, even though we haven't experienced ourselves and you know, take a beat and figure out like, what could I be doing to be more inclusive in this moment for this person with this experience and keep mm -hmm. learning being an ally. And I say this at the, um, in my newsletter every week, I say it in my book, but being an ally is a journey and it's one I'm on myself. I keep learning. I keep getting better, hopefully. And, um, and we have to embrace that, that whole idea of this is a journey. We don't have to get it right from the get go. We have to just start with a single step and keep moving forward to become better allies um, and create these more inclusive workplaces everywhere. Okay, Karen, I have so enjoyed this conversation. I could have kept going for even longer. So help me for the, the listeners here today, what final thoughts do you have for them uh, to take away from today's conversation? I believe that inclusion is a job for everyone. Um, you don't have to have the words like diversity, inclusion, belonging on your business card to make a difference. Um, I am so thankful that so many companies and organizations have diversity and inclusion leaders who are driving those top-down initiatives. That's fantastic. But we need everyone in every corner of the workplace to feel a sense of responsibility around being inclusive. And it doesn't have to be that hard. You can start with a single step. My book is full of them, but also I have this free weekly newsletter, uh, Five Ally Actions, that you can subscribe to to start getting some ideas of what you could be doing to be more inclusive. It's a job for everyone. You don't need to have it on your business card. Love it. So, Karen, where can people sign up for the newsletter and find out more about the books and the consulting work and the speaking work that you're doing? Sure. It's all at betterallies.com for the book and my newsletter. And then if you want to sort of see me in action with past recordings of my keynotes and so forth, you can go to karencatlin.com. All right. Well, Karen, thank you. This is an important topic. I wish you every continued success and influence and impact in the world. Thank you, Mara. It was a pleasure talking with you today, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to your audience. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining Morag today. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe so you don't miss a thing. If you learned something worth sharing, share it. Cultivate your relationships today when you don't need anything before you need something. Be sure to follow Sky Team and Morag on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you have any ideas about topics we should tackle, interviews we should do, or if you yourself would like to be on the show, drop us a line at info at skyteam.com. That's S-K-Y-E team.com. Thanks again for joining us today. And remember, business is personal and relationships matter. We are your allies.